Assalamu alaikum. Today we will be talking about um, thyroid disorders. So um, just to get an overview of what we will be talking about, um, we will uh, be covering thyroid basics, thyroid hormone synthesis, hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis, interpretation of thyroid function test, hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, thyroid nodules, and thyroid cancer. So before we get into um, thyroid disorders, let's talk about uh, a little bit about the anatomy and physiology of thyroid. Thyroid gland is the largest gland in the body. It extends from C5 to L1. Only endocrine gland, which depends on external environment for raw material. So iodine is the raw material for thyroid hormone and iodine has to be obtained from diet. It's not uh, a raw material that you can get um, that is synthesized inside your body. And thyroid is also an only endocrine gland which has the ability to store the hormone and release it when it's required. So just to go over uh, a little bit of physiology of thyroid hormone. Um, thyroid hormone is uh, basically, this is your thyroid and um, thyroid is situated here right in front of the trachea. And then thyroid hormone, thyroid makes thyroid hormone, which is T3 and T4. Um, and then thyroid is controlled by a center in the brain called pituitary, which is in turn controlled by the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is the master gland, which actually makes the TRH or thyrotropin releasing hormone, which in turn stimulates the anterior pituitary to make the TSH. The TSH then stimulates the thyroid gland to make T4 and T3 hormones. Now, all the T4 is then carried into the circulation where, it's, where it is converted into T3. T4 is the inactive hormone. And once it's converted into T3 with the help of the deiodinase enzyme, T3 is the active hormone. 90% of the active hormone is obtained from peripheral conversion of T4 to T3. There is also 10% of the hormone T3 that's directly made from the thyroid gland. So how is the thyroid hormone synthesized? So T3 and T4, the triiodothyronine and the thyroxine are the two thyroid hormones. Um, the biosynthesis required tyrosine and iodine, and it's stored in the form of thyroglobulin. Normally in response to TH, TSH, the thyroid secre secretes predominantly T4, which is 90%, and a small amount of T3. 99% of the hormone is bound to thyroid binding globulin and albumin in the circulation. Only unbound, uh, a tiny unbound form of the thyroid hormone is active. So the changes in any amount of thyroid binding globulin is clinically important as it will change the amount of the unbound hormones. So what is the function of thyroid hormone in your body? So thyroid hormone basically controls metabolism in the body. So it almost affects every organ system in the body. It increases the metabolic rate, which results in increased heat generation and oxygen consumption. It increases gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis. It participates in lipolysis. It stimulates bone maturity and growth. It stimulates sympathetic nervous system. It increases heart rate and contractility, and it increases erythropoiesis. So now, how is the thyroid hormone synthesis regulated? So we talk about the physiology, but now we have to see how it's regulated. So there is a bunch of negative feedback mechanisms that occur that controls the release of thyroid gland uh, from the thyroid hormone. First off, the T3 and T4 hormones directly inhibits the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus. Um, they're directly inhibited the T3. T4 inhibits the pituitary gland, whereas the T3 will inhibit both pituitary as well as the hypothalamus. In addition to that, um, there are also some other protective ways how the body regulates the thyroid hormone. Both physiological and emotional stress which will inhibit TSH and TRH. Um, and this is uh, basically the mechanism of uh, the euthyroid 6 syndrome, which we'll be discussing a little bit later. 
So interpretation of thyroid hormone test. This is by far the most important section uh, which we need to understand very clearly in order to understand thyroid disorders. Normally, in normal clinical practice, there are only three tests that we use for interpretation of thyroid um, gland and functioning. Um, the first off is the TSH. If normal, then no further workup is needed. So TSH is the screening test. If your TSH is normal, you can end your workup there and no further workup should be done. Then if your TSH is high, then you suspect hypothyroidism. So then you have to go ahead and do free T4. Um, TSH and free T4 are enough to make a diagnosis of hypothyroidism. If your TSH is low, then you have to order free T4 and free T3 both. And if hyperthyroidism is suspected. Um, why you need T3, T3 is because in hyperthyroidism, one can have isolated T3 thyrotoxicosis. So if you just order free T4, you might uh, miss if there is free T thyrotoxicosis. Other than these tests, the total T4, total T3, reverse T3 does not have much utility in the interpretation of normal thyroid functioning. Only in certain unique cases, these tests are ordered and we will be discussing those um, as we uh, talk about the various um, thyroid disorders. Thyroglobulin is another test which is used as a tumor marker in following um, thyroid cancer. Its presence in a patient with total thyroidectomy is used as a marker for, for a recurrence. Besides this, there are certain other tests like the thyroid antibodies. So there are four thyroid antibodies that are typically uh, checked. Um, Antithyroid peroxidase antibody and anti thyroglobulin antibody are usually present in um, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, and they indicate chronic inflammation. These antibodies, if, does, is, if present, does not need to be treated as long as the thyroid function is normal. It is very clear, very important to understand that thyroid antibodies does not give you any symptoms and it does not have any clinical effect. Its presence only indicates that you have a higher tendency of developing thyroid problem and that there is some inflammatory changes in your thyroid gland. Thyroid stimulating antibodies and thyroid receptor antibodies are used in distinguishing Graves' disease from other causes of hyperthyroidism. It also helps in evaluating if the patient is undergoing remission. Okay, so now we'll review um, thyroid function tests individually as we see in different thyroid disorders. The two main thyroid disorders that we talk about is hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism. In endocrinology, all endocrine glands are regulated by center in the brain, mostly by pituitary or hypothalamus. And depending on whether the problem is in the original gland or the problem is at, the, uh, is at a central level in the pituitary or hypothalamus, we have a primary and secondary disorders. If the problem is in the gland itself, it's called primary disorder. And if the, gland, if the problem is central or in the pituitary, then it's secondary problem. So when we talk about hypothyroidism, Primary hypothyroidism is when there is a problem primarily in the thyroid gland. So if there is inflammatory changes or Hashimoto's thyroiditis uh, and the gland is not making enough thyroid hormone, then you have primary hypothyroidism, in which case your free T4 is low and your TSH is high. Since the thyroid gland is not making enough hormones, it sends a message to the pituitary where the TSH goes up. Similarly. In case of secondary hypothyroidism, the problem is central. It's in the pituitary, which means that the pituitary is now not making enough TSH. And so the TSH is low. And because of that, the thyroid is not getting the stimulation. And so the free T4 is low. So as you note, in primary hypothyroidism, TSH and free T4 goes in opposite direction, whereas in secondary hypothyroidism, they go in the same direction. Similarly, when we talk about primary hyperthyroidism, the TSH is low, but the T free T4 and free T3 are high. So the gland is actually overactive and it's making too much hormone, which in turn 
shuts off the pituitary and so the TSH is low. Similarly, in secondary hyperthyroidism, the problem is at the central level where the pituitary is making too much thyroid hormone, which in turn results in increased production of free T3 and free T4. So other tests used um, in um, a workup of thyroid uh, disorders is um, thyroid imaging, which includes radioactive iodine uptake and scan and thyroid ultrasound. Radioactive iodine uptake and scan is actually two different tests. Um, they are frequently done together and therefore we, uh, in general terms, we say uptake and scan and it sounds like one test. However, they have different jobs. So radioactive iodine uptake measures the degree of iodine uptake by the thyroid gland. Uptake can be high or low or normal in various thyroid conditions. Like in Graves' disease, the uptake is high, or if you have a hot nodule, the uptake is high. Whereas if you have thyroiditis, um, then your uptake is low. Similarly, the radio iodine scan shows the pattern of iodine uptake. It can be diffuse, focal, or multifocal. It gives information about the size, shape, the shape, size, and overall activity of the gland. And it is used to diagnose both hot and cold nodules and to differentiate Graves' disease from hot nodules. The scan is also used for the workup of hyperthyroidism and it, it should never be ordered if you are suspecting hypothyroidism. So radioactive iodine uptake scan does not have any utility in um, working up hypothyroidism. Ultrasound, on the other hand, is used to evaluate the size of the thyroid and the presence of nodules, and is sometimes um, ordered along with the workup of hypothyroidism uh, to see if there is any cold nodules present. And ultrasound helps us distinguish between the characteristics of the nodule, whether it's solid, cystic, or spongy form, and also it helps us to differentiate uh, between whether there is any malignant features or benign features. So let's talk about hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism, as we discussed, can be primary or secondary. Primary hypothyroidism is a chronic autoimmune thyroiditis, and it's the most common cause. It can also occur due to certain medications, like certain psych medications are known to cause hypothyroidism. Certain immune modulators and checkpoint inhibitors are also known to cause hypothyroidism. Um, high, secondary hypothyroidism, on the other hand, is a pituitary disorder, and it can occur secondary to pituitary tumor or Sheehan syndrome or any other condition that leads to panhypopituitarism. Also, so there are certain medications that can give you a secondary hypothyroidism. Signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism are very nonspecific. Uh, as since thyroid affects almost any organ system in the body, uh, there is a host of signs and symptoms that can occur because of thyroid, including weight gain, cold intolerance, constipation, fatigue, difficulty concentrating, dry skin, dry nails. Um, so, however, signs are mainly not seen in early or mild hypothyroid cases. They are mostly seen in moderate to severe hypothyroidism and would include puffiness of the face, uh, non-pitting edema, bradycardia, tongue enlargement in severe cases, and delayed reflexes. So how do you diagnose hypothyroidism? So primary hypothyroidism, as we discussed, the TSH is high and the free T4 is low. In secondary hypothyroidism, the TSH is low and the free T4 is also low. So remember, in the primary problem, the TSH and free T4 goes in the opposite direction, whereas in the secondary problem, the TSH and free T4 goes in the same direction. Then we have subclinical hypothyroidism where your TSH is high, but the free T4 is normal. It is controversial whether you should be treating subclinical hypothyroidism or not. In clinical practice, the decision whether you should be treating is individualized and we have to consider risk factors such as family history or presence or absence of thyroid antibodies um, before we decide whether we should treat uh, a patient with subclinical disease. Guidelines at this time recommend not to treat um, thyroid um, subclinical hyper, hypothyroidism uh, if the TSH is under, under 10. 
Treatment wise, um, standard treatment for hypothyroidism is T4 replacement. Most patients are started between 25 to 50 microgram dose. And some patients, for example, post thyroidectomy patients are started at a higher dose uh, of about 100 mcg. T4 has a long um, half life and it takes about six to eight weeks for the blood levels to achieve a steady state. Therefore, if you start someone on a treatment or if you're adjusting the dose, you must wait at least six to eight weeks before you would readjust the dose or um, readjust the dose. Dose must also be adjusted in small increments um, of 12.5 to 25 micrograms at a time uh, to avoid over-treatment and increased risk of complications such as atrial fibrillation and osteoporosis. Certain, um, some people like to treat um, uh, 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 thyroid uh, hypothyroidism with uh, T3 or a combination of uh, T4 and T3. Is there any benefit in adding T3 uh, um, under normal circumstances is, is a very controversial issue. Um, randomized control trials have shown that adding T3 does not confer any additional benefit beyond that's achieved with T4 monotherapy. T3 has a shorter half-life and its, uh, its levels uh, kind of fluctuate in your blood uh, and it may lead to hypothyroidism. It's uh, currently not recommended in routine treatment of hypothyroidism, except again in certain individual um, special cases. Myxedema coma is uh, one of the thyroid emergencies. It is uh, um, a condition that occurs due to severe untreated hypothyroidism. Mortality is very high, about 30 to 40% with mixed edema coma. It occurs due to long-standing untreated hypothyroidism. How do you diagnose this is based on long history of long-standing untreated hypothyroidism, and it can be exacerbated by conditions like acute infection, heart disease, opiate use, etc. Patient presents with decreased mentation, hypothermia, and multisystemic failure. Pericardial effusions and seizures can be present and um, other abnormalities like hypoglycemia, hyponatremia, and hyperlipidemia can be seen with mixed edema. Treatment of mixed edema is mainly supportive. Um, institute empiric treatment for hypothyroidism, possible adrenal insufficiency, and antibiotics till the workup is completed. And before we uh, in, uh, institute this treatment, we have to make sure that we draw a TSA, 3T4, a cortisol level, uh, and an ACTH level, and possibly even an ACTH stimulation test should be done. Initial treatment, uh, when the patient is comatose, you can treat it with IV levothyroxine. Um, some suggest using a combination of T4 and T3 in this case uh, because of decreased peripheral conversion of T4 to T3 in mixed edema coma. Next is hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism, like hypothyroidism, can be primary or secondary. Primary hyperthyroidism auto is the most common cause is autoimmune Graves disease. Other than that, primary hypothyroidism can also be caused by a toxic nodule, or it can also cause a transient thyrotoxicosis can also occur due to subacute and postpartum thyroiditis, or secondary to medications like amiodarone. Secondary hypothyroidism is relatively less common, and it usually occurs uh, secondary to pituitary tumors, and um, some medications can also cause secondary hypothyroidism or central hypothyroidism. Signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism, contrary to hypothyroidism, are usually a little bit more specific. So if a person is having a lot of symptoms of primary or hyperthyroidism, uh, it's more likely that they would actually have the disease. Um, some of the symptoms would include weight loss, anxiety, irritability, insomnia, palpitations, diarrhea, heat intolerance, menstrual irregularities. Signs would include warm skin, stare, lid leg, hypertension, increased heart rate. And some of the other clinical effects that can also occur with um, hyperthyroidism would include uh, low and total, and, uh, total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol, uh, a normocytic nomochromic anemia and hypercalcemia is seen. Uh, Long-term effects of hyperthyroidism, since it boosts up the metabol metabolism, uh, could be osteoporosis, increased cardiac output, and cardiomyopathy. 
Graves' disease is a uh, uh, most common cause uh, of hyperthyroidism, autoimmune mediated. It is caused by thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins, which stimulates the TSH receptors in the thyroid gland, which in turn then makes more thyroid hormone. It usually presents along with the diffuse goiter since the thyroid is hyper functioning. 90% um, of these patients will have ophthalmologic involvement. How do you diagnose Graves disease? Again, uh, TSH will be low, free T4, free T3 will be high. You can also see isolated free T3 in case of uh, early Graves disease or T3 thyrotoxicosis. Also, your thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins and thyroid receptor antibodies are positive in Graves disease. Um, Radioactive iodine uptake scan will show diffusely increased uptake in case of Graves' disease. Now, Graves' ophthalmopathy. Graves, it is important to understand that every, all, as we said, almost 90% of the patients with Graves' disease will have some degree of eye problem. Clinical presentation may vary from mild proptosis to frank exophthalmus, periorbital edema, and impaired extraocular movements. Graves ophthalmopathy is worsened by smoking and radioactive iodine therapy. Clinically, Graves ophthalmopathy requires a formal eye testing and sometimes imaging to determine the degree of inflammation. Radioactive iodine treatment is not recommended in patients who have Graves ophthalmopathy as radioactive iodine treatment can make it really worse. However, in certain uh, cases where thyroid medications um, is not working or the patient is allergic to thyroid medications and surgery is not possible, Possible, then in this case, uh, we can treat um, these patients with radioactive iodine treatment after pretreatment with steroids. So as you can see here, um, this is a frank case of Graves' exophthalmus uh, in both the eyes. Um, there's frank uh, proptosis, um, whereas here you can see the one of the eyes more affected and the proptosis is very marked compared to the other eye. Treatment of Graves' disease, um, uh, several uh, different options are available, such as antithyroid drugs, uh, radioactive iodine treatment, as well as surgery. Most Graves, Graves' disease cases are treated with um, antithyroid drugs, as there is 50% chance of remission. Methimazole is uh, currently the preferred uh, treatment of choice in uh, Graves, Graves' disease in non-pregnant patients. PTU used to be uh, the treatment of choice before. However, PTU now has a box warning for increased risk of death due to acute liver failure and is no longer the first line treatment. It is only the first line therapy in during the first trimester of pregnancy where methamazole cannot be given due to its teratogenic effect. It is also the first line of treatment in patient, treating patients with thyroid storm due to its uh, short half-life. Some of the side effects of um, Antithyroid medications includes rash, agranulocytosis, and hepatic toxicity. Guidelines recommend against monitoring CBC and LFTs routinely unless patients become symptomatic. Symptomatic. However, in clinical practice, we don't really wait till the person comes with a liver failure and we kind of um, end up monitoring LFTs and CBCs periodically. Beta blockers will help with adrenergic symptoms while the patient is uh, waiting for antithyroid drugs to work. The other um, options for treatment of Graves' disease would be radioactive iodine ablation. Um, iodine-131 is another option. All patients are pre-treated with beta blockers and sometimes with antithyroid drugs. And most patients become hypothyroid after months, uh, months after treating with radioiodine ablation. Surgery is usually reserved for some um, certain um, situations like pregnant patients or patients who are allergic to antithyroid drugs or and cannot have radioactive iodine ablation uh, or patients who have uh, multiple cold nodules and in that situation, uh, if you need to remove the thyroid, then uh, that would treat both, both uh, conditions at the same time. Graves' dermopathy is a, a, a specific skin condition that occurs with Graves' disease. 
and uh, it, it basically involves a thickening and redness of the dermis due to lymphatic infiltrate that gives it a peeled orange appearance. And it looks different from um, the skin changes that you see in myxedema in hypothyroid patients. Subclinical hyperthyroidism is a condition in which TSH is suppressed or low, but free T4 and free T3 are normal. A patient's clinically does not have any symptoms, and again, uh, treatment is uh, controversial. Thyroid storm is the second thyroid emergency associated with um, high mortality. Severe hyperthyroidism seen in undiagnosed or inadequately treated patients. The precipitating events could be iodine load, surgery, or infection. In addition to exaggerated hyperthyroid symptoms, these patients also sometimes have jaundice and fevers. Uh, it is characterized by severe metabolic stress resulting in relative adrenal insufficiency and is associated with high cardiovascular mortality. Treatment of thyroid storm involves um, use of thyroid drugs. High doses of PTU are used in treatment of thyroid storm initially, and uh, later on, uh, patient is switched to methamazole. Beta blockers, preferably propranolol. Uh, propranolol, in particular, um, has a benefit of, in addition of, in addition to controlling heart rate, it also blocks peripheral conversion of T4. Uh, to T3. And so it also has some protective effect, additional protective effect. Corticosteroids, broad spectrum antibiotics, Leopold's iodine, and supportive treatment in ICU uh, is uh, all involved in treatment of thyroid storm. Thyroiditis is um, basically an inflammation of the thyroid gland. Uh, you have acute thyroiditis, subacute, and chronic thyroiditis. Acute thyroiditis is mostly bad bacterial infection. It presents with severe pain and tenderness and is usually treated with antibiotics. Subacute thyroiditis on the other hand follows viral infection. It will usually present with tender neck and fevers. However, a lot of times this uh, stage is um, kind of passes by by the time you receive the patient. Um, initially, the TSH is suppressed and free T4 and free T3 might be elevated. Radioactive iodine uptake in this case is low. So the radioactive iodine uptake helps us to distinguish in certain cases of Graves' disease from thyroiditis because both Graves' disease and thyroiditis will have low TSH and high free T3 free T3, free T4 levels, but uh, the uptake scan will have different results. The uptake scan will be high in Graves' disease and it will be low in thyroiditis. Thyroiditis, subacute thyroiditis is self-limiting and it resolves on its own. Chronic thyroiditis is what we call Hashimoto's thyroiditis. It is autoimmune mediated and it's characterized by painless chronic inflammation of the thyroid gland. Postpartum thyroiditis is a variant of chronic thyroiditis. And it's also patients who have chronic thyroiditis um, also have um, many other um, autoimmune diseases. Goiter is a diffuse enlargement in the thyroid gland with no metabolic syndromes. Most cases of goiter are idiopathic, but they can be caused by use of goitrogen or iodine deficiency. Workup mainly involves thyroid ultrasound and thyroid function test, including a TSH and free T4. If no nodules are present, then goiter does not need any treatment. And for the most part, you don't have to follow them with ultrasounds every year and ultrasound every uh, few years would be enough to follow a goiter. Multinodular goiter, on the other hand, can be toxic or non-toxic. Non-toxic multinodular goiter are more common and specifically more common in women. Nodules of varying sizes are present throughout the gland. These are mostly asymptomatic and they come to attention because of an enlarged thyroid. Workup of a multinodular goiter includes thyroid ultrasound, a TSH, and free T4. Um, these nodules don't need any treatments unless they are causing compressive symptoms or any disfiguration. Toxic multinodular goiter, on the other hand, refers to multinodular goiter with thyrotoxicosis. These are hot nodules, which means the condition would be suppressed with a free T4, high free T4 thyroidism. However, as opposed to Graves' disease, here the radioiodine 
iodine scan will show the heart nodule. So if you review this thyroid scan, this is how we see the scan in Graves' disease. So this is the entire thyroid, and as we can see, there is increased symmetrical increased uptake in both lobes of thyroid. Whereas in this case, this is a heart nodule where the nodule is, is picking up um, uh, the, scale, the contrast and the rest of the thyroid is sort of uh, has less uptake because the nodule is picking up all the this is another example of uh, a hot nodule there's another small hot nodule here too toxic nodules these are uh, they can be treated with antithyroid drugs but for long-term management the toxic nodules have to be treated with uh, radioactive iodine ablation thyroid insulin the antilomas are nodules that are found accidentally during workup for another reasons, and uh, they're referred as incidentalomas. They are not palpable, and they're worked up in the same way like other nodules with the help of a thyroid ultrasound and TSH and free T4. If a heart nodule is suspected, then you would do a radioactive iodine scan. And heart nodules are almost always benign, and they do never, almost never require a biopsy. So remember, heart nodules don't require a biopsy. If a cold nodule is present, then you have to do an ultrasound, which would give you, and based on ultrasound features, you can decide if the nodule needs uh, a biopsy. So talking about thyroid nodules, ATA guidelines recommends to perform fine needle aspiration biopsy based on patient's individual risk factors, ultrasound features, and size of the nodule. Some of the ultrasound features that are suspicious um, for a malignant nodules would be irregular margins, micro presence of microcalcification, marked hypoechogenicity, absence of hypoechoic halo around the nodule, and lymphadenopathy. So if you can read so let's look at take a look at these nodules. So this nodule here, we can see it has uh, a lot of microcalcification. And so this would be a high risk nodule that we would want to biopsy. Um, similarly, this nodule here all has a lot of irregular borders. Uh, and so this is another nodule that we would want to biopsy. Uh, as opposed to these two now, and uh, very, uh, the margins are very um, regular. And so this is more likely a benign nodule. And in this situation, if the size is not big uh, and um, no other features are present, we would really not need a biopsy for uh, this nodule. So now uh, let's talk about um, thyroid disease in pregnancy. Thyroid function test must be monitored very carefully during pregnancy, um, especially in patients who already have known thyroid disorder. Thyroid development is not completed until the 20th week of pregnancy. Therefore, the fetus is completely dependent on the mother's thyroid hormone until the 20th week. Patients who have hypothyroidism, there is increased requirement of T4 dose until the 28th week. And it is very, very important to check the thyroid hormone levels every four weeks and adjust um, so that we can keep up with that increased requirement. After 20th week, we notice that that increased requirement as the baby's um, thyroid will start functioning, um, you would require less and less uh, change in, in dose mom's dose. For patients with hyperthyroidism, the thyroid stimulating antibodies can cause the placenta and cause fetal hypothyroidism, and therefore close monitoring is required throughout pregnancy. Postpartum thyroiditis is also very common and occurs in 10 to 15% of postpartum women. Patient will present with painless goiter and with hyperhypothyroidism, but it's usually self-limiting and it goes away in, within a few, couple of weeks to months. Lastly, we want to discuss um, uh, quickly um, a little bit about thyroid cancer. Um, incidence of thyroid cancer has been increasing. Uh, some of the risk factors for thyroid cancer includes history of radiation to the neck or chest, exposure to radioiodine, uh, example, people working in nuclear facilities, family history of thyroid cancer, and exposure to goitrogens. There are four main histologic types of thyroid cancer papillary thyroid cancer, follicular thyroid cancer, medullary, and anaplastic. 
Papillary thyroid cancer is the most common type of thyroid cancer, representing 75% to 85% of all thyroid cancer cases. It occurs more frequently in women and presents in 20 to 55 year age group. It is a predominant cancer type in children and it's often well differentiated, slow growing and localized. Um, speaking, no one dies of papillary cancer. If you, it is a very slow growing, very benign uh, type of cancer. If, if you have papillary cancer and if you even don't do anything for about 10 years, probably nothing would happen. Follicular thyroid cancer, on the other hand, is the second most common and mimics normal thyroid tissue. And because of that, it is very difficult to differentiate um, a follicular thyroid cancer from a follicular thyroid from, from a follicular adenoma. As it is associated with early hematogenous spread to bones and lungs, um, and the capsular invasion is an important part of staging. As if the capsule is involved, then um, you suspect uh, early spread of this cancer. Medullary thyroid cancer is associated with hyperplasia of parafollicular C cells and secrete calcitonin. Medullary thyroid cancer can occur sporadically or it can be inherited as a part of MEN 2A and 2B syndromes. MEN syndromes are associated with mutation in red, red protoencogens. And so um, medullary thyroid cancer tends to uh, run in families and uh, genetic testing might be required for this. Anaplastic uh, thyroid cancer is a high-grade undifferentiated carcinoma of the thyroid. However, it is very rare. It is occurs in two to five percent. It is two to five percent of all thyroid cancers, um, but it is responsible for almost forty percent of thyroid cancer deaths. It's a rapidly en enlarging bulky neck mass, which advances, invades um, the structures very quickly, and presents with a huge mass, hoarseness, dyspnea, uh, and dysphagia. Um, life, it's, the prognosis is really bad and uh, death occurs within six months of diagnosis. There's really um, not uh, a lot of treatment available um, for this type of cancer. Thyroid lymphoma is associated with chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis. Um, one must think of this uh, in a patient with chronic autoimmune thyroiditis with fast growing mass. So the picture looks like chronic autoimmune thyroiditis, but if you see um, a, a thyroid mass really um, uh, growing really fast, uh, you must um, biopsy these as this could be uh, a lymphoma. Most common tumor type is B cell lymphoma. It is treated with chemotherapy and external beam radiation. Treatment-wise, um, thi treatment of thyroid cancer um, involves thyroid, either thyroid lobectomy or total thyroidectomy, depending upon whether it's unifocal or multifocal and what kind of cancer we're dealing with. And uh, it can be followed by radioactive iodine treatment if needed. There are certain criteria for who needs radioactive iodine treatment and who doesn't. Patient is um, started on suppressive treatment for three, four post-operatively. Most differentiated cancers remain suppressive to TSH, so keeping TSH in suppressive range will help prevent recurrence. Oversuppression must also not be done as it may increase the risk of hyperthyroidism. Long-term follow-up can be done with radioactive iodine scans, thyroid ultrasounds, and thyroglobulin levels in those receiving radioactive iodine treatment. Thyroglobin levels in those with total thyroidectomy and radioactive iodine treatment must be below detectable levels. And any increase in these levels will suggest recurrence. And that uh, concludes our talk. Um, thank you very much for listening to the lecture.